Good morning, everyone. We're just thrilled to have you here today for the webinar on strategies for engaging young single males and experienced workers with low literacy skill levels. It's an awesome webinar, and uh, I'm sure that you'll enjoy it. So uh, my name is Joanne Cottery, and I'm from Community Literacy of Ontario, and I'm going to do some brief housekeeping before passing it on to, uh, to our presenters. So I just wanted to tell you who's online. Often when uh, we're on webinars, we like to know that, and seldom do you get told. So we're happy to tell you that uh, you, here on this webinar, the audience is made up of uh, literacy and basic skills educators and people from employment services. The majority are LBS providers. Uh, almost 60% are from LBS. 20% are, are ES providers, and another 20% are provide both e LBS and ES services. So that's that's wonderful. Everyone who's online is from Ontario, and we uh, this webinar there'll be a total of uh, of almost 70 participants who have joined. So that's very exciting. The majority of people are from southwestern Ontario, but we have a strong group from the north, which is wonderful, and also from uh, smaller groups from central and eastern Ontario. So that's who's online, and welcome to you all. One question we've already had in question chat, and I'm sure the rest of you have it, uh, is, is will this webinar be recorded? And we're happy to tell you, yes, it will be recorded, and it'll be uh, available on the website of Literacy Link South Central, the Learning Networks of Ontario, and, and our website, Community Literacy of Ontario. And we will send you all those links, so you don't need to worry about writing them down. Uh, which brings me to the point, this PowerPoint presentation will be sent to you after this presentation, so you don't need to worry about getting URLs and resources and so on written down. So the last, uh, the last point that I wanted to make is that we, we will be holding questions until the end of the webinar. It's jam-packed with all kinds of exciting content, but, uh, but Anne-Marie and Summer, your presenters, will stay online at the end of the webinar and answer questions. So, uh, but in the meantime, we'd love to hear from you via, uh, via text chat, which you can see on your screen there where the blue arrow is just pointing. So please post any questions, comments, uh, resources you might have heard, your, pers your experiences with uh, working with this client group, anything that would be helpful. We'd love to hear from you, and uh, your questions will be answered at the end. So uh, without further ado, I am happy to pass it on to Anne-Marie. Thanks. Thank you, Joanne. Good morning to everyone from Literacy Link South Central. Since January 2013, Literacy Link South Central has been working on labor market partnership project together with six other Ontario literacy networks. Each of the strategies that are related to this project focus on bringing lower skilled and marginalized clients closer to employment. This is an Employment Ontario project funded by the Ontario government. Today, in this webinar, we'll be addressing the two strategies through this project that Literacy Link South Central took the lead on. Literacy and the Young Single Male, coordinated by me, Anne-Marie Curtin, and a second strategy called Targeted Employment Support for Job Seekers with Low Literacy, coordinated by Summer Burton. We'd like to thank Community Literacy of Ontario for their technical support during this webinar. Since I was the coordinator on the Young Single Male Project, I'll be guiding you through the portion of the webinar that relates to this strategy. After I'm done, I'll be inviting Summer to talk about the strategy that she took the lead on. So why did we want to develop a strategy around the issue of literacy in the young single male? Through literacy service planning, it was brought to our attention that there's an increasing number of young men who are assessing Ontario Works in London. And this trend's not unique to London, Ontario. Several other communities agree that this is an emerging issue for them as well. At the time of the proposal for this project was written, there was an estimated 2,000 young men in London, Ontario on Ontario Works who have been on a caseload for longer than 12 months and or who have had less than a grade 12 education. These are London's lost boys. 
The image of the Lost Boys might make you think of Peter Pan's cute little children who were accidentally left behind by their parents, or you might think of the blood-sucking vampires in the 1987 movie titled The, Lond the Lost Boys. Either way, London's Lost Boys are disengaged from their community, and the services we provide could help them move forward on their path. It makes sense for Literacy Link South Central to take an issue to take on this issue. First of all, it fits the work of a literacy network, bringing together community partners to explore an issue and develop solutions in response to that issue. Literacy Link South Central has done several youth-focused projects over the years. In fact, when I started working here in 1998, I was hired to develop youth literacy and employment resources. More recently, in March of 2013, Literacy Link South Central completed a project titled Targeted Literacy Programming for Young Single Males on Ontario Works, or as I affectionately called it, SMAO. Through the SMAO project, we conducted a literature review and focus groups, which informed the design of the four workbooks you can see on this slide. The information we collected during the SMAO project formed a great foundation for continued work with young single males. Before I continue, I want to make sure you know the specifics of our target population. Youth for the purposes of this project are between the ages of 18 and 29. This age range falls under the mandate of provincial adult literacy programs, so we are in a position to serve them should they seek out our services. The youth we focused on were male and in the London area. When possible, we included, those, we included those who receive Ontario Works and those who don't have children. What I didn't touch on during this project was other variables such as addictions, mental health issues, disabilities, and so on. It would become pretty cumbersome to def further define young, single males on Ontario Works. This project was supported by an advisory group that consisted of community members who had a stake in the issue. We had employment counselors, an Ontario Works caseworker, the executive director from Literacy Link South Central, the executive director from the local workforce planning and development board, a literacy practitioner, and a consultant of lived experiences, meaning in his not so distant past, he was one of our target population. Youth employment is currently a global issue. A global economy, technology, and countries struggling financially are just some of the contributing factors. Most of this is out of Literacy Link South Central's area of influence. Some other areas that are discussed within the context of youth unemployment include the public education system, government policies, and the role of parenting. These are also areas that we can't make changes in, although we'd love to come up with a formula to prevent young males from becoming unemployed and disengaged in the first place, this would be a lofty and unrealistic goal. The challenge for this project soon became clear. With limited time and resources, we needed to define what we could realistically explore and influence. Considering our involvement in the Employment Ontario system, we saw that we could focus on youth engagement in employment agencies and literacy programs and the transition between the two systems. Early in the project, the advisory group was asked to make assumptions about why young, single males were becoming stuck on Ontario Works. These assumptions weren't necessarily statements they believed, just comments on why this trend may be occurring. These assumptions helped to guide the research and conversations going forward. So I'm just waiting for the slide to change here. Next one. There we go. Okay. These assumptions include males leave home earlier than females. Families may be more willing to cut loose a young male versus a young female, or maybe the male youth leave earlier in an urgency to experience independence. Young men without children are less motivated to succeed since they have no responsibility or anyone depending on them. The target population is comfortable on Ontario Works. 
The money they receive may be enough to live on considering that a large group of young men can live together with very little means and couch surf. We also talked about how there is a risk in going off of Ontario Works. Once someone becomes comfortable with the rules and processes of how to get Ontario Works dollars, it may seem to be intimidating to try to get money through employment that comes with a whole other set of rules and lifestyle. Generational poverty. The fact that this is all they know as their families were also supported by Ontario Works. Those of you who have taken Bridges Out of Poverty training would have a deeper understanding of the implications of this. Many have criminal records that block their ability to work, and therefore the youth have no incentive to move forward with any employment goals. As an aside, this in the end seemed true. At an employment agency gathering I attended, many of the agencies estimated that 40% of their caseload had criminal records. Changes to the clearance process recently, the resulting complex steps, and large fee increases might mean that a pardon is not attainable for many employment agency clients. And now, employers frequently use criminal records to check as a screening tool. This could explain why someone with a criminal record feels stuck. Another assumption we made was that technology is causing a lack of socialization, so youth are less likely to seek community services. Low social skills may also cause them to be less successful in job search and employment. We assume the target population especially those with less than a grade 12, are not interested in education. We assume that employers might be reluctant to hire youth. Considering recent funding given to youth employment initiatives, it seems that the government recognizes this might be true as well. In the recent SMAL project, focus group youth said it's easier for females to get a job. They thought employers hire females first, especially for retail sales and customer service jobs. We were also curious what role the media might be playing in causing apathy in youth. During this project, it seemed that almost daily reports were coming out about youth unemployment, with much focus on how youth with university and college educations couldn't find work. Those reports would hardly provide motivation for our target population to want to go back to school or to use employment agency services. Our next step was to use these assumptions to guide the research phase of the project. We used a variety of ways to collect feedback from those who might have a stake in the issue of London's Lost Boys. A resource review early in the project combined with the advisory group's assumptions helped us to develop the questions for surveys. We then surveyed employment service providers and literacy programs. While this was happening, we also pulled together focus groups with the target population that were participating in programs. We thought it was important to also hear from youth that were not in programs. To this end, our consultant of lived experiences went to the street to collect information. I'll touch on just a few of the aha moments I had while reviewing articles and resources related to the project. One of the first articles I read was by Mark Prensky. In 2001, he coined the terms digital natives and digital immigrants. Even though his article was written in 2001, it still applies today, maybe even more so. Prensky explored the impact of technology on youth who were raised with it. He stated that youth don't have to learn technology. It's an inherent part of their culture. Students now absorb and process information differently than those that have gone before them. He called on teachers to recognize the factors that are different between themselves, digital immigrants, and their students, digital natives. In fact, he goes further to say, our students have changed radically. Today's students are no longer the people our educational system was designed to teach. In the second article, Prensky asked, digital natives, digital immigrants, do they really think differently? He explored how the brain's processes change and adjust according to the stimulation it receives. He related this to the impact of technology on youth brain functions. This article claims that youth today have short attention spans, but for old ways of thinking. Through this article, he creates a compelling case for the need to make changes to the education system to better fit the learning needs of generations raised with technology. 
I highly recommend both articles that focus on digital natives and digital immigrants. They're an easy read and quite thought-provoking. We sometimes assume that youth are uninterested in school and community programs because they're lazy. But what if the reason was that our programs are formed in a way that they really can't process, comprehend, and learn from them? An article written by the Ontario Public School Board asks, how can schools continue to be connected and relevant in the world of the 21st century? This article challenges the education system, especially educators, to examine how they use current technologies in the learning environment. It warns us that integration of technologies in schools is not matching the pace of multimedia technology use in the world beyond schools. In a technology-based world, we receive constant stimulation from a variety of sources. Youth may feel real learning happens when they are free to access technology on an as-needed basis and then process information in a way they've become accustomed to. The article states, Many students feel, however, that when they come into school, they have to power down to fit into an environment that offers fewer options for learning than are available in the life they live outside the school. This can erode students' perceptions of the relevance of education as they experience it in many schools today. Now, throughout the project, when I discuss the idea of programming needing to be more stimulating for you, a number of people feel very strongly against this idea. I've heard over and over that the work world often isn't stimulating. Youth might succeed in our newly designed, engaging, and stimulating programs, but then will fail at work, because work isn't like that. I would argue, though, that work is more stimulating than we give it credit for. For instance, in a literacy office one day, might involve returning emails, while talking on the phone, then writing a report, but having to put that aside because while, you're, while, the report, while writing the report, a message from an online forum you belong to just popped up, and now you realize that a major budget is due to the funder by the end of the day. So you start working on the budget while checking your cell phone, and you see that your child is sick and you need to go pick her up at school. As a matter of fact, how many of you have read and responded to emails while listening to this webinar? In this article, G proposes that classrooms that incorporate the foundational elements of video games may see increased success in learning. The author states, lots of young people pay lots of mo money to engage in an activity that is hard, long, and complex. As an educator, I realized that this was just the problem our schools face. How do you get someone to learn something long, hard, and complex, and yet still enjoy it? He argues that the gaming elements are valuable in the workplace. G explains how risk-taking and failure are the basis for successful problem-solving, and that games often build teamwork and communication. High School Dropouts Returning to School explores the role of gender as it relates to leaving and re-engaging in the school system. This report reveals evidence-based ideas as to why males versus females drop out of the school system. Young men cite it wanting to work as a reason to leave school more often than young women. This research shows that young men with children will more likely instead work instead of return to their education so they can earn a living for the sake of their children. This article shows us the importance of making a clear and strong connection between education and work. It also speaks to the value in designing a co-op style program where learning and earning can happen simultaneously. This idea of a blended work and education approach was further discussed in a paper put out by Essential Skills Ontario in 2012. The author stated, an education-first approach is often far too removed from employment for the vast majority of adults for whom high school was not the right fit in the first place. I'd like to say this is also true for youth. As our project progressed, it became clear that the youth felt that returning to an education seemed like an overwhelming commitment and not part of a clear path to employment. CIBC stated that one in five youth aged 15 to 24 not working today has never held a job. And therefore, statistics show that work who gain work experience and receive on-the-job training while studying are much more likely to find suitable and sustainable employment. 
Again, this makes a strong case for the value of integrated learning and earning opportunities. Recently, Community Literacy Ontario provided a series of tips based on suggested practices by literacy providers on how to engage, motivate, and maintain Ontario Works and ODSP clients. These tips will be good to carry forward when designing programs to meet the needs of that population. Suggestions include making sure you offer positive reinforcement and structured learning opportunities where clients can feel a sense of accomplishment. Later, I'll be discussing the concept of gamification, which is a program design model that can address these suggestions. And now, on to our survey results. 22 employment service providers responded to our survey monkey. The questions were designed to address the assumptions that I spoke of earlier in this webinar. Respondents generally agreed that there's a disconnect between what jobs youth want and what skills and knowledge they have. Having children didn't seem to influence youth participation in programs. Very few youth at the employment agencies have been involved in literacy programs. Several of the male youth in their programs had criminal records. One employment service provider added, the more desperate the circumstances, the less likely right and wrong will enter into the equation. The need for mentors continued to pop up in people's responses. It was interesting that in separate responses, this word was continually used. And another consistent message was that youth were easily discouraged when the road to education and employment seemed long. Literacy service providers from our service area said that youth often attend their programs, but because they had to, usually as a requirement of Ontario Works. Predictably, the youth left the program when they felt they had met Ontario Works requirements. Generally, they stated that this age group is less successful in their program than older age groups. One said that young men tend to be unfocused, that this client group appears to be disinterested compared to the other client groups, and that young males have been disengaged from regular school system for a number of years. Respondents also stated that youth were unable to see literacy as part of their employment journey. Again, participation didn't seem to be influenced by having children or not. And a common theme seemed to be that youth lacked the ability to communicate for the purposes of job searching. One respondent said, many youth have not been taught how to use the phone to contact an employer or how to present themselves in person. They're almost used to making their connections through text, Facebook, and Twitter. There's almost a lack of confidence in being able to do anything else. Employment counselors I've spoken to about this agree that this is a trend they're seeing as well. During youth focus groups, we asked what they would need to know before returning to school. Not surprisingly, they need to know how more education would be useful to them. One focus group participant noted that returning to high school takes too long. Another group participant stated he might return to his education in a couple of years if he's not getting anywhere. They often spoke of cost as a barrier to education. Even though most hadn't completed high school, they only thought of post-secondary as an educational option. Therefore, it's not surprising that money was seen as a barrier to returning to school. It's interesting to note that non-Ontario Works focus group participants had a high school diploma, whereas the majority of young men without high school diplomas were on Ontario Works. What the focus group feedback suggests is that these youth need to see a stronger connection between education and employment for two reasons. One, to choose a realistic career based on their skills and knowledge, and two, to maintain motivation while in education. As you might be noticing by now, this is a theme in all the feedback we've covered so far. If you recall, I said that one of our advisory group members was a consultant of lived experiences. This person, Jamie, offered to meet with youth at street level and gathered information from those who seemed totally disengaged. Over the course of one week in October, Jamie met with close to 80 of London's lost boys. 
He went to the food bank, to the daily meals program, to the parking lot of a local temporary agency called Labor Ready, to the men's shelter, and outside the central library. He engaged in casual conversations with the youth in hopes to hear responses to the survey questions we had around learning and employment. He reported that many youth had a similar background story. They left home at 17 because their mothers would lose the financial benefits for them once they turned 18. With this lack of income for this child, the family's money would be getting tighter. The youth were pushed to drop out of school for work, or sometimes they left school in hopes of picking up more hours at a part-time job they may already have. Criminal activity and charges were so common that when Jamie asked them if they had a job, their response was commonly, like a real job? From his conversation with the youth, we came up with five summary points that you see here. Youth are unaware of the literacy and employment services that are available to them. The youth thought employment services were temporary agencies, and they often had preconceived ideas of what they were allowed to access. They only do things that their friends will do. Jamie noticed that they only talked or engaged with him when a friend came along. The more friends that were drawn to the conversation, the chattier the group was. They lost interest in school, but are interested in learning through a hands-on approach. Commonly, they didn't like school and are not interested in returning to their learning. Jamie asked them what they would think of learning something in a workbook, using a woodworking table as a desk, for example, and then turning around and applying what they just learned on some tool right in class. In many cases, the youth would excitedly reply, there's a place like that? Where? Youth are not easily approachable and are not very trusting of people they don't know. This is something that many of us might already know, but it's a good thing to keep in mind. Many youth in our target population can only rely on themselves, or as one youth in the focus group put it, I can count on my shadow. What this tells us is that it's very important to build a trusting relationship with youth in our programs, but it won't be easy to do so. These youth have low self-esteem and feel like just a number, especially since they might belong to several systems. Again, this isn't a big surprise for many of us, but it's a good reminder that building self-esteem, confidence, and sense of self should be the foundation of any programs we do. I often discuss this project even with friends and family outside of work. It's interesting to note that there seems to be two schools of thoughts about how to best engage London's lost boys. Meet them where they are, or bring them to us. A meet them where they are approach includes creating innovative programming that meets the needs of digital natives who are immersed in technology stimulated environment. As we heard over and over, these youth find school uninteresting, dull, boring. We also read that it might not be their fault because they might be wired to learn in a different way than we're teaching. Should we try to accommodate this? Those on this side of the argument say we have to. What we're doing now as a society in general just isn't working. Those in favor of bring them to us approach say we have to engage youth and bring them into our current programs. In this model, we would make them familiar with how the work world operates outside of their needs so that they're better prepared to participate when the time comes. Employers aren't going to try to accommodate them and neither should we. Both schools of thought make a very strong case, both having pros and cons, but there must be some middle ground. Going forward, I'm mindful of a quote I recently heard at an immigration partnership meeting. The quote was about the four degrees of cultural awareness, and youth can certainly be considered their own culture. My way is the only way. I know their way, but my way is best. My way and their way. Our way. Literacy Links South Central will try to find this balanced approach with the initiatives going forward. However, we'll use the meet them where they are statement as a guiding principle. This statement speaks to a wide range of potential youth engagement strategies, including geography and individual needs. The following are activities we hope to take on to bring London's lost boys closer to employment. As you've heard, it seems we have a marketing issue. 
youth are often unaware of our services and how they can benefit from them. We hope to design messages that can be marketed to the target population to show them a strong connection between literacy and employment. We also want to let them know that there's a system of services in their community that, that, that can help move them closer to employment. We'll explore where we can strategically place these messages. I read recently that youth go to Kijiji to find out about local services. If we want to meet them where they are, our services should be posted there as well. When I explored a variety of literacy and employment websites, I noticed that in most cases we don't cross-post our services. This would make sense for the youth who use one service and have need of the other. We hope to develop videos to make youth service providers aware of services so they can confidently speak to them with their youth. This takes our key messages to the places youth go. Meet them where they are. We'd also like to create videos for youth and, if possible, use peers in those videos. When combining feedback and research, three ideas have come to mind for program development. One, use gamification techniques to draw in youth and maintain their motivation in programs. Without going into too much detail, let me tell you what gamification is. Gamification means using the fundamental elements of gaming and applying them in program design. Collaboration, competition, ranks, and levels are just some of the concepts that apply. Gamification is becoming a big part of our daily life. Gamification programs are being used to motivate employees and consumers alike. It's also playing a major role in training. You might not even know when you're participating in a gamified process. Any of you who have a points reward card are participating in a gamification program. Recently, I signed up for Dropbox and found that the more people I get to sign up for Dropbox, the more space I can earn. I was being gamified. How can gamification programs design be used in our programs to engage youth? We hope to explore this further. Real Voices I recently heard a presentation from the City of London about a pro program they ran called Real Voices. This was a youth-led initiative where older youth helped younger youth create videos. The presenters spoke of the leadership skills and confidence developed by the participants. This program sounded like it might be a good fit for the second phase of this strategy, so we'd like to explore this possibility further. And last but definitely not least, a learn and earn co-op style program. As you know, we heard from several sources that they, we need a program where learning and working for a wage happen simultaneously. We hope to explore what this could look like with the help of our EO partners, some who are also employers in this community. I've included mentorship in a small print because it's something that we heard was a need, so we'll watch how it fits into the strategies we hope to move forward with. And no matter how engaging the content of a program might be, it would be a huge oversight to not consider other factors such as the learning environment, the process we use, the expectations we have of participants, and how we facilitate. There's little use to putting effort into marketing and program content if we turn off the youth after their first visit to the program. For instance, how many of us ask about source of funding during intake? How would this feel to a young man who's met you for the first time and who's embarrassed about being on Ontario Works? Going forward, we see some potential challenges. The first one being that the beast will be released again. We'll need to be mindful that we're restricted by time and resources. However, we will have an advisory group and feedback from youth to help guide us through the process. Another challenge might be engaging London's lost boys. That challenge is the nature of the project, the nature of the beast. We hope to rely on our community partners to help us with this, especially to gain access to their clients that fit the target population. So thank you for taking time today to hear about our Literacy and the Young Single Male Project. If you have any questions or comments, I'd love to hear from you. Our contact information will be highlighted at the end of the webinar. But now it's time for me to turn you over to Summer Burton so she can tell you about her project, Target It, 
uh, titled Targeted Employment Support for Job Seekers with Low Literacy. Thank you. As Anne-Marie said, my name is Summer Burton, and I'm the project coordinator for the second strategy that we're going to be discussing today, which is called Targeted Employment Support for Job Seekers with Low Literacy Skills. The first thing for us to clarify is who the target client was for this particular research strategy. Our focus was on job seekers with a solid history of working, but who are being passed over for employment as a result of not having their minimum OSSD or GED standards, which as we know are often required in today's labor market. A client who left school with a grade 10 education and worked for 20 plus years in a factory before losing their job would be a good example of the client we were considering. I want to take a moment to recognize the LBS and ES organizations whose members sat on the advisory committee for this project. Their roles and responsibilities included participating in bi-monthly meetings and online discussions, providing a local perspective, relevant background information, and expertise related to the focus client group, and offering recommendations to project staff. Without them, this project wouldn't have been possible, and we're grateful for their input and their guidance. The project began with an original hypothesis that we could partner with job developers to move unemployed workers with low literacy skills to employment more quickly through the use of targeted wage subsidies. In the early stages of the project, we met with the Job Developers Network of London Middlesex, representatives from the Job Developers Network of Norfolk, Brant, Haldimand, and Oxford Counties, and with Ontario Works. At each of these meetings, project staff discussed the idea of wage incentives being a potential solution to our clients' issues. Across the board, we were strongly discouraged from attempting to rely on the use of wage subsidies to bring these clients to employment more quickly, although everyone we spoke to was supportive of establishing other kinds of partnerships between LBS, ES, and OW to offer support for these clients. It became clear that the use of wage subsidies while available to support some clients in our target group, were not a viable enough option to be considered a solution, and that a change in vision for this project would be necessary. We decided to formally revise the focus of this strategy to remove mention of the use of wage incentives and instead focus on researching other supports that could be provided by LBS practitioners. Our project became centered on both researching those possible support options and on relationship building within employment services agencies. As part of that relationship building, we arranged outreach sessions with programs both inside and outside the LBS and ES community. We began that process by meeting with representatives from the Center for Lifelong Learning to discuss how their employment-specific ESL training, for example, ESL for call centers, could be used to inform an LBS to employment training model. We then met with the March of Dimes to discuss their Working Fundamentals program and how their approach supports clients to employment, noting that their focus client group are those with disabilities. We also met with representatives from the Goodwill Career Center to review their process for supporting clients and building relationships with employers, looking for new ways to support this client group, either with or without the use of training incentives. To ensure we had a clear vision of the barriers facing current LBS learners who fit the client profile, a survey was sent to literacy programs across Literacy Link South Central's six-county support area. Survey participants were asked to consider this client's connection to employment services and indicated that a significant number of learners within the agencies that responded to the survey could be considered part of our target demographic, but that the majority of them were not using employment services as well. We were not surprised to see the results when we asked what the most prominent fields of work were for those learners in the target demographic finding that many used to work in physical jobs in industries that have suffered greatly from economic downturns in the past decade. Survey participants also identified the top barriers that, from their perspective, are preventing those clients who aren't accessing support from ES from doing so. They include 
prioritizing more pressing needs before seeking help from employment services, a sense that there are too many hoops to jump through to access employment services, the belief that there's too much work to be done in both to handle EES and LBS support at the same time, and the feeling that LBS and ES services must be done sequentially. We asked survey participants what they thought ES and LBS could do to better support this particular client's journey to employment, and many references were made to offering flexible programming hours and a variety of classes and workshops for clients, acknowledging that one size does not fit all. Several suggestions also focused on the need for early recognition of impactful literacy issues by employment services agencies and the benefit of increasing partnerships between ES and LBS organizations to allow for better management of client needs. Building workshops into LBS programming that introduce learners to the support ES can provide was also suggested. We mentioned earlier that we began a face-to-face -face outreach campaign as part of this strategy. It was at this point in the project that those outreach visits kicked into full swing, with project staff reaching out to employment agencies throughout London and requesting an opportunity to visit. When we contacted agencies to outline the purpose of the project and ask if we could spend some time on site with them, the reaction was wholly positive. I'm pleased to say that project staff was warmly welcomed at each agency and ES representatives expressed a strong desire to work collaboratively to support experienced job seekers with low literacy skills. Through a series of 14 visits to ES agencies to meet with employment counselors and job developers, discussions were held around the intake process, whether it was group or individual, the supports clients have available to them, timelines to access service, and what expectations clients face when moving through the system. At each meeting, project staff also asked ES representatives to walk them through the client experience, from the moment of a first phone call or walk-in to a successful transition away from ES support. While recreating that journey, project staff observed the environment of the agency, when and where clients are asked to fill out paperwork, how quickly clients are able to access in-house support from employment counselors, workshop facilitators, and or job developers, and when referrals for LBS support might be made. In addition to gathering information about the journey our target client experiences at different ES agencies, project staff also discussed how supports offered by Literacy Link South Central could be used by ES staff to assist their clients. Information was shared about the wide variety of literacy programming in our community, and a referral tool was handled out, handed out. ES staff were also encouraged to call Literacy Link directly to seek advice on appropriate programming for their clients. Much valuable learning and a more connected LBS and ES relationship was gained based on meetings with employment services representatives that are shown here. I won't go over them each individually, but we certainly extend our thanks to them for their warm welcome and their time. To further our understanding of the client experience, project staff also attended three group information and intake sessions. Goodwill Employment Center's Community Training Service group intake session for OW clients their Discover Your Options group intake session for EOS clients, and the London Training Center orientation session for new ES clients. The 14 ES site visits and three group intake sessions that we attended resulted in a much clearer picture of current ES processes. It also showed us several places where partnerships could be further developed between LBS and ES to support experienced job seekers with low literacy skills. We've developed a top six list outlining some of the key learning from our visits. First, while the path through employment services is similar from agency to agency, there are some significant differences. They include the length of time it takes to get an appointment with an employment counselor, how intake is done, the in-house support available for clients, 
and the targeted clientele that the agency is best suited to support. Secondly, while all EO-funded agencies use the Employment Services Participant Registration Form, some have the client fill it out without supervision, some with, and some actually fill much of it out for the client, changing the opportunity to discover any undisclosed literacy issues. Most agencies have additional in-house paperwork completed either by the client or by ES staff that complements or enhances the information required on the registration form. Literacy issues are often identified through these forms or through obser observation during workshops attended by the client. It's also interesting to note that there are many specialty programs available through employment service agencies in London that might be a particularly good fit for our target demographic but which LBS agencies may not be aware of and therefore do not identify to their clients. There are also community-based and LBS programs that are geared to bringing employment-specific learning to clients, but which, LBS, or which ES providers may not be aware of. The key to getting clients to access these programs is to ensure that both LBS and ES staff are fully aware of the support offered by each other's agencies. Some employment counselors would be interested in the support of LBS in new ways, such as with creating training plans for incoming clients, assuming that the time were available for LBS staff to work on site in ES agencies. That bleeds nicely to our fifth point, which is that many job developers in locations where LBS and ES are co-located believe that the support and partnerships necessary to bring the target market of clients to employment is either already in place or is at least more easily accessed than those agencies that are not co-located. When asked about attrition rates for our clients in the target demographic, many ES representatives reported lower patients for long-term support within the target group. Experienced workers with low literacy skills who've lost their jobs are in crisis, want swift intervention, and bounce from agency to agency if the support they need isn't available quickly at the first. They will also leave ES or LBS support behind if employment is obtained, even if their skills still need upgrading. While it has been determined that the second phase of our labor market partnership project will not include this strategy, the key learning points described earlier have inspired the advisory committee and project staff to make several recommendations for next steps anyway. While there are no quick fi fixes for the issues faced by this client group, it's our belief that many of these steps would help support both them and clients outside their demographic, and several can be actioned even outside the structure of this labor market partnership project. The first recommendation would be to shorten the length of time it takes for clients to move through the employment services system by ensuring that they begin their ES journey at the agency best suited to serve them, rather than having the client try on several agencies before finding one that fits their needs. We recommend creating a referral chart for employment services, much like the one that exists for literacy agencies. The chart would outline the unique differences between ES providers, as well as agency hours, workshops offered, bus routes, and other information that will help literacy programs make effective referrals and recommendations for their clients. The advisory committee further recommends identifying those outside the literacy field who are recommending that clients go to employment agencies and ensuring that they are given support tools to make effective formal and informal referrals as well. The advisory committee identified several non-traditional points for recommendations to employment services, including Service Ontario, libraries, neighborhood resource centers, and Ontario's 211 service. And they recommend developing relationships with each of those organizations to facilitate more effective referrals. Also, much like LLSC encourages phone calls from ES and other organizations to get recommendations on which literacy programs would suit the needs of their clients, the advisory committee would like to see a similar service offered by an employment services support agency. This service would allow employment specialists to provide referral support via phone calls, getting answers quickly for clients in need of a very fast response. Our fourth recommendation would be to offer clear writing sessions to employment services agencies to help them update their informational brochures and workshop training material so it can be clearly understood by their clients with lower literacy skills. 
We would like to see attendees work together with the support of a clear writing consultant to modify some of their current material as part of the session so they could walk out of the experience with handouts that are ready to use with clients immediately. We would also recommend the creation of training modules for use at literacy programs that outline what the ES experience will look and feel like. So as experienced workers with low literacy skills transition to ES support, they'll know what to expect and aren't intimidated. We would recommend including samples of the paperwork that they'd be required to fill out and customer service friendly touches like photographs of the agency from both the outside and inside. To make the transition more seamless, the training should set the client's expectations about timelines, the job titles of the staff they will encounter, and what workshops or support they'll be able to access. A second stage of this recommendation would be to partner with employment services to create information sessions that can be held in high traffic areas like the public library, outlining the support available not only through employment services, but also literacy, the health unit, housing, and other services most often needed by experienced job seekers with low literacy skills. Our sixth recommendation is to strengthen the relationship between ES agencies and literacy networks by broadening our outreach visits so ES representatives feel comfortable calling the literacy networks to ask questions and seek support for their clients. A second stage of this recommendation would be to establish cross-trained literacy and employment advocacy positions. The role of a literacy and employment advocate would be to travel to both literacy and employment agencies, answering questions about each service and offering support to staff and clients alike. MTCU's vision for Employment Ontario includes the concept of a fully integrated system that appears seamless from the client's perspective, and such a position would lead to smoother transitions from LBS to employment for our clients. We also believe that employment services and literacy programming hours if they were coordinated, it would allow for, much, for many more learners to access support from both LBS and ES concurrently, rather than sequentially. Most e easily done with programs that are co-located, the coordination of service schedules would also benefit the experienced worker with low literacy skills who leaves programming once they achieve employment, rather than staying to continue their upgrading. A second stage of this recommendation would be to research potential incentives for those learners to stay in the program, even after obtaining employment. When developing these recommendations, we noted that should they be executed, the top barriers preventing unemployed workers with low literacy skills from accessing support from ES, as identified by the LBS Client Profile Survey, would be removed. Through this project, Literacy Link South Central has increased their understanding of the opportunities, supports, challenges, and changes required to best support experienced job seekers with low literacy skills. In the process, we also strengthened our relationship with employment services providers and have already seen the result of that enhanced relationship in an increase in phone calls from ES agencies asking for literacy program suggestions for their clients. It's our hope that through the recommendations outlined in this presentation, we can further develop those relationships, enabling an ES and LBS collaboration that more thoroughly supports experienced workers with low literacy skills. That brings us to the end of our presentation on the first two strategies for bringing lower skilled and marginalized clients closer to employment. We're pleased to have had the chance to share them with what will be the first five webinar of five webinars on the subject. We hope you'll consider joining us for the remaining four webinars. Mastering the Puzzle Pieces, Relationship Building, on December 11, 2013, delivered by the Quill Learning Network and the Tri-County Literacy Network. Industry and Employment Programs, Working Together in Dufferin County, on December 13, 2013, delivered by the Peel Halton Dufferin Adult Learning Network. Labor Adjustments and Literacy Activities on December 16, 2013, delivered by Project READ Literacy Network. And finally, LBS Practitioners in Linking Learning to Employment on December 17, 2013, delivered by Adult Basic Education Association and Literacy Link Niagara. When this presentation is emailed to you, the registration links for each webinar will be included. But if you'd like to access them more quickly, not a bad idea as these webinars are filling up quickly, then please email literacylink at belnet.ca directly to request the registration links.
We'd like to thank you all for joining us today and mention that you'll be presented with an evaluation as you leave the webinar. Please take a moment to fill it out to provide us with feedback on this session. As we mentioned earlier, this webinar has been recorded and a copy of today's presentation will be sent to you. This will officially bring our session to a close. That said, we certainly welcome your questions about the two strategies that we outlined, either via the contact information that's on your screen right now, or uh, by remaining online following the end of this presentation. Joanne and Vicki from CLO will assist us with your questions via GoTo's chat feature for the next five minutes or so.